Let me give you this picture. Because I don't think we think enough of sex. One of the things we have to do is we have to think like Christians and we have to think like Christians in every area. You can't simply have a piecemeal approach to this. We have to have a biblical worldview across the board. Across the board. The sexual union between a man and his wife is a living, breathing, awe-inspiring expression of the ecstasy of the union that the church awaits. The people are the most valuable resource in the universe. Let's see if I can do this. Hey, y'all, it's Water Break with Water Boy and John Branion. I believe in you, Gabe. I I, believe you can do it. Technology is going to work this time. It is good to be with you guys. Good to have John here in the, not in the studio, but maybe you should move to Idaho. You know what? This virtual reality thing has made it very difficult to decide whether or not you're actually in the studio just because you are electronically present. I mean, it's a whole uh, esoteric, ex- existential question that we probably don't have time to go into right now. So. No, no, we don't. It's This is only a 20, 30-minute show. So. Well, it's, you're the one that brought it up. Remember that. It wasn't <laughs> me that did that. How are you doing today, man? I'm peachy. I, am, I, I haven't really been thinking about anything except the FLF conference coming up next week. Yeah. And so it was... I was out on a walk today uh, talking to, to God about how I remember when, it, when I was a kid and my birthday would come around and it would just consume the entire month prior to my birthday where I would yep. just try to race through as many days <laughs> just to get to my birthday. And my mom would say, we shouldn't wish your life away, John. You should not wish your life away. But I've been totally wishing my life away in anticipation of the FLF conference. Yeah, so. me me too. It's uh, we're gonna head out. We actually head out on uh, Sunday. We got some early um, uh, events we need to do uh, at the beginning of the week. But it's gonna be. I'm excited. It's gonna be a, a long week for us. But there, we got over 1,200 people coming and excited to be fellowshipping with everybody out there at the uh, the Fight Laugh Feast conference. Man, it's a uh, it's gonna be trippy. So I can't wait. We'll make some friends and we'll do some podcasts and we'll that's right. Tell some jokes. And <laughs> that's, right. Feast. that's right. That's right. And, uh, as uh, our listeners know, that if you can't be there in person, you can sign up, join the club. We stream live all our conference stuff online. All the talks will be streamed live through the club portal, not not online to everybody, but through the club portal because our club members support what we do. So we want to make sure we're kind of giving you guys some value and the support there. So if you can't make it in per- person, go to fightlabfeast dot com. Sign up, be club a club member. You know the the bronze or or greater club members get access to the live stream. So. Um, and then you'll be able to be there just the same way that I'm in the studio right now. That's right. That's right. The comedian next door, just like this. Mm-hmm. Uh, so like this. The, the other thing I want, I want to bring to attention, I think some of you guys already know this, but um, we've, we're um, trying to reach out and trying to figure out how to build a business network with all the cancel culture stuff going on. So uh, in, in the meantime, while we're thinking through that, please connect with us, your business with us. Go to, fight, laugh, go to flfnetwork.com forward slash business flfnetwork.com forward slash business and just sign your business up there. Um, we're still trying to figure out how to kind of, uh, we have a bunch of Christian businesses uh, that want to connect with each other, connect with like-minded businesses. We haven't quite figured out how to facilitate all that. But in the meantime, connect with us. Garrison will be in contact and we'll, we're going to try to figure out how to maybe kind of create like a, I don't know, a fight, life feast business network of like-minded businesses that would like to do business with each other. So go to flfnetwork.com forward slash business. It's a good idea, good idea, John. You should sign up Comedian Next Door on there, man. I should. If I had some sort of a business, I would be there. <laughs> but you guys kind of already know how to get a hold of me, right? We I do. Mean, I'm, not a, I'm not a mystery to you guys. But what if someone wants to connect with a comedian? What if another business wants to connect with a comedian? Well, that's um, – all right. I'll – you talk me into it. You'll heavily, okay. heavily think about, heavily think about it. Okay, <laughs> this brings. I don't know what to call my monologue that I'm going to be doing here. Uh, you know, should I call it 
beer break with water break or you know i mean what what should we call this segment the monologue segment beer, beer break on the, on the water break yeah that, that, that. Um, no i i like it i you should take uh take suggestions from the from the listeners there you go they, they, they'll probably have an idea there you go I'll guys send you an email. put it in the comments here on youtube or on facebook uh, and you know, what should we call the monologue segment beer break with water break or, um, I mean, cause it's five o'clock in the afternoon. It's kind of like, we're almost out of water break, you know, um, er, you know, we time need water anymore. Yeah. Not, not, not after five. <laughs> not after five. <laughs> so funny. Do you notice how I'm, I'm still trying to figure out what my role as sidekick quote unquote is. And, uh, the first thing, the first assignment that you tried to give me and I lateraled it. To the listeners, did you notice that? That was good. How slippery I am. That was good. Um, and so, all right, here's one for our listeners. Come up with a nickname for John. There we go. I was thinking about that too. I was thinking about what you know, sidekick should have a proper name, and it should be something that coincides and works akin with Water Boy mm-hmm. or Water Break. And the first thing that popped into my head was hand towel and <laughs> hand towel guy. I, well, I probably shouldn't have even mentioned that out loud because I was so underimpressed with hand towel as a sidekick name that I thought I'd keep it to myself, and I went ahead and admitted <laughs> it anyway. Now people know, but now they know that that the bar's so low that they're going to be comfortable commenting on on YouTube or, well, or that, Facebook. That's the problem with nicknames is once people figure out how much you hate them, it makes it much more likely that they will stick. Then it it's so you can't. It's done. Maybe it's we'll see. Done. Let's let's we'll, we'll, we'll look for the comment section, see what feedback we get, and then um, uh, maybe we can do a top ten nicknames for John Brady next next week. <laughs> <Top 10. laughs> Outstanding. Let's do it. All right, into the into the beer break here. Um, as you guys have been paying attention, you know we pulled out of Afghanistan uh, uh, this last week. Uh, August thirty first was the last day we were allowed there, according to the Taliban. Now, according to the Taliban, that was the last day we were allowed there. So our, our president, who some might call, you know, resident Biden, uh, he decided to pull our troops out of Afghanistan and then circled back around. This is what is so crazy about this whole thing. He circles back around after our troops were ordered to abandon the safe zones and strategic airports he had secured. We had secured, not Biden, uh, uh, to then pull out all Americans, all Americans and Afghan allies. So, so he pulls out all the troops. We abandon the safe zones. We abandon the strategic airports, and then we come back in to kind of rescue all the Americans and the Afghan allies. Doesn't that seem a little backwards to you, John? Seems backwards yeah, to me. It, the, the whole thing seemed seemed almost uh, seemed almost unprofessional to me. I th- I think I think we have people in the military whose job it is to oversee logistical things like coming into a place and going out of a place. Mm -hmm. I mean, don't we have entire branches of the military that that think about stuff like that? I don't think the commander in chief remembers that. You don't think he knows about those people? He's forgotten. (laughs) You ever ever see the press? I do, but he doesn't. Yeah. You ever see the press conferences where he's trying to like remember one of his secretaries and he's like, Oh, what's then what's the person I appointed? What's their name? I can't. Yeah. Yeah. It's well, you know what? I can, I can, I can forgive that. I can I can understand that the president of the United States has a lot of people yeah, that are true. you know around him. And so I understand that if you're going to forget a name or two, that's not a problem. But okay. to forget that there are that there's a whole branch of experts that know how to move equipment and personnel all over the globe, yeah. to forget about that, that's a little uh, much for well, me. I think there's some legitimate questions there. Um uh but I yeah, I don't know I don't know how to think about why did Biden do this? I, I just politically, it blew up in his face. Why did he do it? That I, I don't even know the real answer to that question. But but last after he pulled everybody out um, on August thirty first, or maybe it might have been the morning of September first, he he tweeted this out. He said, "Last night in Kabul, the United States ended a twenty year war in Afghanistan, the longest war in our history." We completed one of the greatest airlifts in history with more than 120,000 people evacuated to safety. No nation has ever done anything like that before. And I was thinking, this is literally like saying, you know, I, I lit my house on fire and then I rescued, you know, 50% of my guests. 
or something. Right. It's like, right. I, no, I created this no disaster. House guest has ever, no homeowner has ever done that before. <laughs> never burned up half of his house guests. That's, you know? that's right. Well, it's, it's a little bit like going to, a, uh, to the ball diamond. You go to the ball diamond with your team for a pickup game, and, mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. and then the, the other team comes, they show up, and then you decide, you know what, we're just not even going to fight. We're, we're not even going to play this game. Mm-hmm. And then you leave all of your bats and your balls. You even leave your bicycles and your coolers and everything. And you just go, you guys can just have this stuff. We've decided that we don't want to play anymore. Yeah, and we're going to get into that here in a minute, all the stuff that we end up leaving behind. But I think what struck me about like this this tweet that he sent out is is he was basically declaring victory. He was bragging about whatever sort of victory he mm-hmm. thinks was there, but but then what about you know what about all the college students that were that were left in Afghanistan? I think there was something twenty nine uh, college students out of Sacramento. I mean, is that is that a victory? What about all the military equipment that was handed over to terrorists? Um, and I want to actually, I want to take a minute to walk through all the military equipment he handed over. Now, keep in mind um, the data that I'm going to bring up kind of spans between. 2003 to 2016 because um, there's a lot of cumulative equipment that you kind of bring over over the years. Some of them have probably been blown, been blown up or whatever, but here's all the equipment that we brought over between 2003, 2016. Uh, we brought over uh, like 40,000 light tactical vehicles, 22,000 Humvees, uh, 8,000 medium tactical vehicles, uh, uh, 189 armored personal carriers, Two, you know, there's almost 200 of those, and um, I got some data here. Uh, the mine resistant vehicles range from 400,000 to you know 700 plus thousand. The recovery vehicles, like like a, a truck wrecker that cost uh, that base model will cost anywhere from 160,000 to 880,000. It's just amazing what the military can spend on all this, and um, and then he left about at least. Uh, or between 2004 2016 there there was about 300,000 plus rifles that were brought over there 125,000 pistols 64,000 machine guns um now i'm not arguing that all of these were left there but a majority of them probably were because they were training the afghan a- army to to you know be res- be able to resist terrorism and so they handed a lot of this equipment off to the afghan army a machine gun those are the the M two forty models are priced between six thousand dollars and nine thousand dollars. Grenade launchers go from a thousand to five thousand in between that range, five thousand each. Um, although, however, a manufacturer contracted with the army, I think in twenty twenty, and sold fifty three machine uh, grenade launchers for fifteen thousand dollars each. Um, and then this is the most egregious, I think, part of all this: a uh, hundred and ten helicopters. 60 transport cargo airplanes that includes like the the c-130 light airplanes intelligence uh reconnaissance and surveillance planes uh, a black hawk helicopter can cost between 20 to 40 million dollars uh a-29s which is one of the planes uh that were i i kind of breezed by was uh, it cost 20 million plus for one of those planes and then of course the c-130s i didn't even have the dollar amount for the for the c-130s that's a lot of money i think i think it was over uh we spent over 83 billion i think i just kind of summarized about 83 billion dollars worth of equipment um and we spent more than that on the war over the, over the 20 years that we were there well i think biden's declaration of, about you know uh, that he had in this tweet here is a really wrong-headed and arrogant He's correct on one thing here. No nation has ever done anything like this. No nation has handed no. over eighty-three exactly. billion dollars in a cumulative military equipment and supplies over a twenty-year war, um, and I sp- suspect that's a lot higher. And so he is and right. Declared that as a victory. No nation has ever done that. That's, that's exactly true. right. That's exactly right. And so, how can you declare this a victory? I think Biden, in his speech this week, I don't know if you heard his. I don't know if it's is a speech because he doesn't do interviews any anymore. He said we evacuated ninety percent of those people who wanted to be evacuated, and then said some Americans who had Afghan roots wanted to be left behind. That's that like that was one of his almost a quote in his speech. And, you know, 
uh, Af- Americans who have Afghan roots want to be left behind and just killed. You know, he then proceeded to blame Trump in his speech. He blamed the Afghan president in his speech. He blamed the Afghan military for all his problems. And like uh, Ed Litton, he refused to take responsibility. <laughs> right. Our president, I mean, this, I don't think there's, when you don't take responsibility for um, your decisions and the deaths that your decisions um, caused, I mean, that is really coward cowardly. And just like our evangelicals, like, Rick Warren, who couldn't find a wolf in sheep's clothing if it bit him in the ass. Russell Moore gladly writes about the evils of the Trump administration while eagerly fawned and drooled to the, at the opportunity of meeting with the Obama administration. I don't know if you remember that. Russell Moore, like, mm-hmm. had his, got his, as soon as he could, got his meetings with the Obama administration, refused to meet with Trump. Tim Keller is happy to warmly welcome the new atheist chaplain at Harvard talk about the evils of our immigration system at the southern border with New York Times while ignoring the homosexual dance performances going on in his church services. Right. I, don't, I don't know if you ever saw this, John, but Rick Warren, uh, not Rick Warren, uh, Tim, Timothy Keller had oh. three men doing a ballerina dance during, during the serving of the Lord's Supper. Um, no. Oh, you got to Google didn't. it. It is horrible. It is awful. I, I, I had... I I was a big fan of Tim Keller when I read Reason for God, Mm -hmm. Um, and that was all I knew about him. It was a good book. I read that book, yeah. And uh, so I became a Tim Keller fan. But then as years, I'm I'm always cautious about becoming a big, big fanboy of of famous people because I'm I'm waiting for something like that to happen. Mm -hmm. And my, my issue with Keller over the years was not really, I didn't have a major like falling away, but I just noticed that he started to become um, increasingly more and more vocal about uh, the the church's responsibility to the poor and the, and, and the, the insignificance of churches basically outside the big city. Now he never said it like that, but his tweets were always very much, Big city is where God is moving, right. and out in the urban areas is where nothing of consequence happens. And right. so if you really want to be tapped into the living power of God, you've got to be involved in some sort of urban ministry. Right. Mm-hmm. And I always just thought that that was a little bit unnecessary yeah. to be that elitist right. about our, you know, where we live. Right. So last word here. Now the Holy Spirit blows where he wishes, and he can save, save whoever he wills, but generally speaking, reformation and revival will not come from Pharisees like Rick Warren and will not come from Sadducees like Tim Keller. Reformation and revival um, will not come from the halls of Congress or the grandstanding of Big Eva while their house is on fire. Reformation and revival will sweep our land through the small begotten prayers of our faithful grandmothers, through the hands of mothers changing diapers and faithfully honoring the post that God has given them, Reformation and revival will come from fathers breaking their backs, protecting their families, and providing for the spiritual conditions that create the right soil for their children to thrive and grow in the knowledge and the fear of the Lord. And fathers leading their family in repentance, digging into God's word, and faithful worship. Like that's where reformation and revival comes from. It's not it's not compl- complicated. You know, God obedience is is simple. Obedience is not is not complicated. What complicates things is sin. So I think our republic's hair is on fire. Um, Biden is is barely with us. And Republicans' ability to resist is about as good as a wet noodle. And But as Christians, we can take great comfort in the God who is in heaven and is sovereign over our circus. And we, this really has gotten to be a circus. Uh, not one hair falls from our heads that God does not know about. So, and God loves us and he sees all the wicked schemes around us. And so, you know, I, I mentioned last week, you know, kind of my heart was burdened, but you know, don't, don't fret, don't fear, trust and obey. And as the hymn finishes this with, um, for there is no other way. And with all these schemes, you know, I mean, I, I really feel like like the, the devil is scheming right now in a way he wasn't scheming, um, you know, 30 years ago, although I think his schemes were going on always. He never stopped scheming. But it seems like like there's a rise in activity from uh, multiple 
places of schemes going on in in our culture. And and so man, don't don't fret, don't fear, you know, just grab a beer and relax. God's in control, you know. On the water break. That's right. Well, That's right. Reformation, uh, and I agree with you, Reformation and revival does not come from Pharisees. It doesn't come from false teachers. And, uh, and it doesn't come from political parties either. And I think if we've made a mistake in the church, it's been to ally with a particular political system and, and label that system as, as good and a means to, an, to God's end. And uh, that's just a dangerous thing to do. God has never allied himself with kingdoms, with earthly kingdoms. Right. He's always put himself up above those kingdoms and, and has been very clear. Those kingdoms will rise and fall, right. but I am going nowhere. I, right. My kingdom lasts forever. Right. And I think there's a lot of uh, well-intentioned Christian Americans who have been snookered for the mm. past few decades into believing that if you are properly conservative or property, properly Republican, um, then you are then you are blessed more so than your political adversaries, right. and that's just a dangerous thing to think. Right, and we we talked about this before, John. But uh, one of our friends says that he kind of lays the the I don't know societal collapse or whatever um, at the feet of pastors and comedians. Because pastors and comedians' job is to tell the truth, both in their gifted ways, um, and so I blame you, John. I was I was with you when you said pastors. I was a little confused how comedians got listed immediately after pastors. Yeah, but you know, from a biblical standpoint, that is. Yeah, I, mean, I can I can I can track with you about spiritual leaders uh, being accountable for the flock. But I'm, you're going to have to help me unpack the Greek uh, and the Hebrew meanings of the comedian. Well, I think I think there's a cultural. What basically what he's saying is pastors play a a and comedians both play a cultural role, and in, in telling the truth to society, not just to the wall, not just to their the pastors to their church, but but also to to the world. Um, you're familiar with the Overton window effect. And, and I, you know, uh, I mean, comedians are getting canceled because the Overton window effect has shifted, you know, and, and, and so, you know, things are bad when comedians are getting canceled. First pastors started getting canceled, you know, whatever, talking about the sin of homosexuality, but now comedians are getting canceled because that window has shifted so much. And, um, the prof, you know, in some sense, comedians have a kind of a prophetic voice and they're able to make fun of real truths which have an impact on how people think yeah well what's been really interesting to watch is the, the comedians comedians used to get canceled in church or uh, for a number of years before before the church mm. kind of caught mm. up with the culture yeah and and the the church people by the same token were rejecting almost every secular comic because they were vulgar and they were obscene and they were, they did not represent, you know, God's holiness, which is all true. Right. Um, as, as far as it goes. Right. But the fact is that even secular comedians were many of them, the, the good ones at least were saying true things. Right. They didn't, they didn't proclaim the gospel. So they missed the most important truth, but they were saying things that were true and and they were being accepted for that. The people that that rejected the uh, the secular comedians were the church people. Right. And it's re it's been really interesting to watch how those same comedians now are being rejected by the culture. They're right. being rejected by the the culture that used to love them for saying the exact same things that they've always been saying all along. Right. So what's happened is that the culture has just devolved we, we've just we've rotted to the point where we can't stand the truth anymore and it doesn't matter who it comes from if it no, comes from a, from a preacher or from a comedian we hate it yeah if they're saying the truth so give me an example of where you've been canceled by the church oh my gosh i've i've gotten i, I have dozens of examples of churches 
that not, not as much recently, but when I was starting out, I would get phone calls. Um, this is before the days of the internet and people would want to know what my act looks like. And, you know, such and such Baptist church in somewhere or wherever would say, well, do you have a tape? And I, so I would send an audio tape of my act, um, an audio tape, a cassette tape, yep. boys and girls, look it up. You yep. can find one in the museum. <laughs> and that was how I got work. Well, I'd send a tape off and I wouldn't hear anything for a couple of weeks. And then I'd get a phone call and they would start to have a lot of questions. Well, what about this joke? And what about that joke? And we don't think this is appropriate. And we don't think that is appropriate. Mm -hmm. And I would say, well, I'm, I'm sorry that you feel that way, but if you're super concerned that I'm going to say something that is outside of the boundaries of what you approve of, then you should probably find a different comedian because I right. can't, I just can't stay inside all of those boundaries. Right. And there were a number of times where they would just cancel. They, they would just get cold feet at the prospect of me talking about whatever it was that bothers them. Right. And, uh, and, and that was, but that was always church people. Yeah. Um, I, I, I remember having a um, short story here. I was with the club staff. I was working at a comedy club downtown. And uh, we went out after the show. It was late night Saturday show. And we went out and we were sitting in the tavern and we were having, you know, a conversation. And I'm surrounded by people who are absolutely not Christians. They do not share my faith. Um, these are, you know, homosexual people and drug addicts mm -hmm. and, you know, your typical comedy club staff. Yeah. But, but they were friends and we were having a decent conversation. It's to be about 1 a.m. And I look at my watch and I go, gosh, I got to go. And I was sitting next to the manager and her name was Terry. I said, I got to go because I got to teach Sunday school in the morning. Yeah. And, and it was true. And so Terry yells down the table. She says, hey, John's leaving. He's got to teach Sunday school in the morning. And I sort of braced a little bit, expecting that there would be some, you know, some guffaws. Yeah. But every, everybody said, all right, Brandy, we'll see you next time. Good see you. you know, yeah. Goodbye. No, nobody said a word. Yeah. about me teaching Sunday school, you know, leaving the tavern to go to Sunday school. Right. And I was driving home and I thought, I thought, you know, if I was to take that table full of people into my Sunday school class, I don't think that the reaction from those church people would be the same as what I got from them when they found out that I was going to church. Right. You know what I mean? Right. The, because the church people has a, have had a very definite idea. Now, this was a number of years ago, but the church people had a definite idea of who belonged at church and who didn't. Right. And that that is different now. That is that is upside down now. Right. The the people who are who are outside of the church don't see the church people as as just innocent um, people who right. look who don't believe like we do. Who right. spend their who spend their weekends doing different things than we do. Right. The people outside the church now see us as bad people. Mm -hmm. They see us as as villains mm -hmm. who are trying to take away their rights and they're trying to to oppress women and trying to um, to cause harm. Who actively trying to cause harm right. is what we have now in the culture. Right. I, I have a friend who's a comedian um, and he pitched his Netflix or his special to PureFlix, the Christian online streaming company. And yeah. they rejected it because he used the word panties uh, in his stand-up bit. And it wasn't in a, yeah. any sort of illicit way at all. Um, but they rejected it because of, of that, that word. And it was just like, uh, oh, my goodness, this is what Christian comedians have, have come to. And well, with, yeah. with that said, I think we have um, a top, top ten from Branion. I got a, where's my stinger for you? Did you hear that? I got a stinger. Did you hear okay. that? <laughs> you did. And so uh, th uh, this week's top 10, here's, let me get the, the, the background country music going. That's, that's just what we're doing right now. Cause it's, it's just a honky tonk top 10 ways to effectively love your neighbor that don't require a mask. This is, you know, for Rick Warren, isn't it? Yes. Uh, that that video actually came out like mid March. It dropped originally in mid March, but it's kind of making the rounds again because Rick Warren has suggested that the most effective way that we can love our neighbors 
This is Pastor Rick Warren. The most effective way that we can love our neighbors is to wear a mask. And uh, with all due respect, I think that there are more effective ways to love your neighbors that don't require wearing a mask. That's right. Uh, and here they are. Uh, the first way that you can that you can effectively love your neighbor is you can obey God. <laughs> remember the golden remember the golden rule. Yeah. Uh, Gabe, remember the, how, the, how the golden rule was you're supposed to love God with all of your heart. That was first. Then you love your neighbor. Right, right. And so the first one is you've got to love God. Uh, the second one is you have to obey Christ. So that, obey God and that sounds, obey Christ. That sounds redundant. Yeah. Well, and then the third one is obey the Bible. They, that so sounds if you, redundant. If you obey if you obey God, you are automatically going to be loving your neighbor. If you don't obey God, then it's impossible for you That's to right. love your neighbor. That's right. All right. Uh, fourth thing that you can do is you can leave Rick Warren's church. Ooh, yes. That That's <laughs> definitely in the top ten. Yeah. Well, you can also leave Tim Keller's church, <laughs> and you can leave Ed Litton's church. Um <laughs> All three of those things are excellent ways that you can start loving your neighbor. That's good. Uh, you can stop doing the same thing over and over again, expecting different results. <laughs> Isn't that the definition of insanity? G.K. Chesterton came up with that. Yes. If you uh, if you can stop, basically stop acting insane, then your neighbors will be more adequately loved. <laughs> um, you can also remind your neighbor that masking is only effective at catching things like President Biden's drool. Ooh, that that's true. That's effective at catching drool, but that's it. But viruses are much smaller than drool. Um, <laughs> and then uh, I like how you, you worked can, that out. You worked that one out for us for the for the audience. You went. You're yeah. like, oh, oh, the the joke there is that masks can actually catch drool. <laughs> Not viruses. Yeah. It doesn't actually catch <laughs> let me, viruses. Let me explain that to our audience. <laughs> I'm trying to connect the pieces. Sometimes, I'm sorry. Sometimes I do that. I, one of the key rules to, to being an effective comedian is you have to assume that the audience is as smart as you are. And I uh, am sometimes guilty of That's um, right. making that rule. That's right. Um, so um, I don't know that this is as much a, a list or, or a, uh, a way to love your neighbor. As much as just a question, but what about whatever happened to my body, my choice? Wasn't that a thing? Wasn't that a thing that applied when you wanted to murder a child? John, doesn't you, it? You know, does, you're using their logic against them doesn't really work. Uh, <laughs> using, <laughs> that didn't really answer my question or clear anything up for me. No, so, but all you're I'm doing is you're, you're just trying to use their logic against them. Well, as so. long as I want to murder a baby then it's I my have body freedom mind. to do that. Mm -hmm. But if I want to not wear a mask, mm -hmm. um, okay. All right. And the number one thing that you can, uh, the number one way that you can love your neighbor without wearing a mask is to make a mask out of an old sock and then throw it away. <laughs> I got my drum. My drum is a little late for you. <laughs> That's all right. I'm, I'm playing the with the board. Is, the important thing is the effort. Yep. Um, well, got, there is... There is absolutely no doubt in my mind that if God had intended us to wear a mask in order to love our neighbors, then something in the scripture would say, thou shalt wear a mask in order to love thy neighbor. Yeah. But it doesn't say that directly. And so I am, uh, I'm, I'm a little offended by the uh, insinuation that somebody who just has a more famous ministry than I do gets to determine that you're close, you know, that being vaccinated is absolutely the correct way to love your neighbor because Rick Warren says so, or Tim Keller says so. And well, and I, I, I just I think that it. we've politicized our healthcare so bad and it's really mm -hmm. sad to watch like guys like Rick Warren and, and uh, you know, uh, Russell Moore was doing the same thing. They're probably being mm -hmm. paid by the CDC to do this campaign stuff. And it's really, uh, we've politicized our healthcare so much that these guys are getting sucked up in it. And the crazy thing, we, we played this on the midweek fix this last week, was um, watching Rick Warren. Um, one of the things he said was, you know, um, not to politicize the pandemic. 
And as Toby pointed out on our show, and he's like, and he's talking, Rick Warren's talking about guys like me and you. Right. And he's saying, like, we're he's the saying, ones doing it. we're the ones politicizing the pandemic. And it's like, right. wait a second. No, we aren't. We aren't right. politicizing the pandemic. The CDC is. Joe Biden is. Fauci is. And you can just, all you have to do is just listen to, you know, what they were saying in March 2020 and listen to what they were saying three months after March 2020. And you can see they're right. politicizing it. Well, and so are the people who are saying that the, the proper way to love your neighbor is to wear a mask. That's politicizing the pandemic. That's, That's right. making this this political thing um, a matter of faith. That's right. And I'm not the one doing that. And that, yeah, Beth Moore says the same thing. It's inexcusable for a Christian to politicize this pandemic. It's like, who are you talking to? Are That's you talking right. to me? That's right. Because I'm not doing that. Well, you know, I think... Uh, Christians need to, you know, we, we've said this a lot recently because um, it I, I, we can't get away from what's happening. You know, the first crime scene is, if you don't know anything about it, the second crime scene is always going to be worse. And, right. at, you know, Christians need to start kind of waking up and how we see the second crime scene that we're in. You know, I I I can't believe what's going on in Canada. We're going to talk, I think, a little bit more about that on the show Sunday night. I can't believe what's going on in Australia. Um, at, at, at what point, John, would you leave Australia? You know, would you leave it now? Oh, I've been, Go, I've been it, gone a long time ago. You, you have, you have been out of Australia a long time ago. Well, let's say you're in Australia now. Would you stay? Yeah. Yeah. I, uh, you know, it, it, it's, it's easy for me to sit here in a totally different country in a That's totally right. different system sure. and say, well, this is what you ought to do. And so I don't, I don't want to do that, right. but I, I am, and I'm also curious about how many people there are like you and me and like the Fight Lab Feast members who are actually over in Australia, but nobody's paying any attention to them. Yeah. Um, and part of the strength of the media is the fact that they are so loud that they make you think that you're the only person on the planet That's who right. believes what you believe. That's right. Yep. Because all you ever hear is the godless nonsense that spews from the television and from the radio and from the major sources of news. That's right. And that's a, that's a powerful thing. It's an, it's intimidating and it will wear down your spirit mm -hmm. if you believe it. Mm -hmm. But I think there are good people in Australia. I think there are good Christian people who are trying to stand up for what is true and they're just being um, shouted down. Well, and I think I was just thinking about this today with the guys, but I'm uh in Tasmania, we know there's a good church work happening uh, in Tasmania. And so I think at, at minimum, I would check into that and maybe move to Tasmania, gather there. Tasmania is a smaller landmass. And so you yeah. actually might be able to put up more resistance and a better fight and create your own liberties there on that, I guess, island, Tasmania, country of Tasmania, yeah. island, whatever. Um, and that's that's what I would um, start with is maybe figuring out if I can move there first and then create a nice little maybe place where you can fight from and everything. So good people there. If you guys want us, if you, if we got Australia, if we got listeners in Australia, which I know we do uh, reach mm -hmm. out to us, contact at fight, I'm glad to put you in touch with those, those people, our friends in, in Tasmania. So um, yeah. with that said, I can't wait to see you John next week in Tennessee. It's going to be a, a good old banging of a time. Looking forward to seeing mm -hmm. you there, brother. Um, and until next week, you guys, we'll see no water break next week. So, uh, maybe we're two weeks out to getting back to this, but until next week, drink extra water tonight because no water for two weeks. That's right. Yep. That's right. Until next time, go love God and fight, laugh and feast. Do you know where you're going to be at September 9th through 11th? I do. You're going to be in Lebanon, Tennessee at the Fight, Laugh, Feast conference on the politics of sex. Ooh, okay. All right. Well, do you know why you're going to be in Lebanon, Tennessee at the politics of sex conference? I just Country music center of the world. No, uh, no, because if cool. we don't get God's design ordered rightly in our lives, you know, male, female, family, marriage, culture, yeah. marriage, you know, the, the politics of sex, what yeah. we're talking about. If we don't get uh, this right. Well, we're going to get what we got right here, right now, in this culture, which is hell-bent on destroying itself. Yeah, you know right. why else you're going to go? Why? Voting's going to be there. Hey! David Bonson, Pastor Doug Wilson. Yes. You guys going to be there? I'm going to yes. be there. Uncle Gary's going to be there. C.R. Wiley's going to be there. Ben Merkel's going to be there. Everybody, she That's more than Fab Five. <laughs>
We got SWAT talks all day Saturday. I mean, everybody from the Fight Life East Network's going to be there. Oh, and I'm looking forward to the psalm singing, the ruckus psalm singing, and the Holy Ghost speaking in tongues. Whoa. No, we're not doing that. No, no, no we're not, not doing it. Next conference. Go to flfnetwork.com, <laughs> click on events and register now. There's also a link down in the show notes. Just go down there, scroll down, find it. It's right around there somewhere. I think. Yeah. What if we have a translator for the tongues? No. Okay. 